In an article entitled The Happiness Formula, the author outlines obstacles to our happiness as well as a proven formula for how to become or remain happy. The article begins, I used to believe that I could find happiness on an exotic trip or by earning more money and buying more things. It didn't take me long to realize that buying experiences and material wares only give us a temporary boost of happiness. We soon forget about the previous purchase and start grasping after the next big thing. This longing, much like in Buddhism, is, as the author asserts, the cause of our waning happiness. But is there more at play here? Will reorienting our wants and desires create more happiness? If so, is it permanent or fleeting? Or is there a better way to achieve the happiness we seem to long for? Stay tuned until the end. If this is your first time here, make sure and hit the subscribe button so that you never miss a video or an interview. Our goal is to help you enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. The author begins by outlining some of the reasons why we are always striving to get more or greater things. First, they note our evolutionary instinct. Our ancestors, it says, had to constantly hunt for more to ensure their survival. We have inherited this instinct for desperately seeking resources and security. But nowadays, in a world where most of us are living quite comfortably, it's not really necessary. While it may be true that our ancestors had to constantly hunt for food or do things to ensure their survival, we do have somewhat of an instinct to seek resources for survival. And I would agree with the author that much of what people acquire or think they need is not necessary for survival. And oftentimes it's not necessary at all. And we should be better stewards of the resources with which we have been blessed. I would only add that we should be great stewards of our wealth and resources out of respect for the one who has given us access to those things. Proverbs 3 9 reads, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Likewise, Proverbs 21 20 reads, precious treasure and oil are in the dwelling of a wise person, but a fool consumes them. The second reason the author gives is comparative nature. He writes, as humans, we always tend to compare ourselves to others, whether it's material possessions, accolades, or social status. This constant comparison has been made worse by the connected world we live in, where social media has made it almost addictive to show off our gains in life. Well, I believe the author is correct that comparison kills. Comparison kills passion and stifles growth. One story helps us illustrate this. World famous fashion designer Vera Wang couldn't find what she wanted amongst the available bridal wear, so she designed her own gown and had a dressmaker tailor it. Her bridal wear now appears in over 55 upscale retailers. She's not the only wedding dress designer, but she's probably the most recognizable. Her unique style in a crowded arena made her a household name. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility will help reduce the negative effects of comparison as well as the desire to brag about acquisitions or accomplishments. The third reason listed is hedonistic adaptation. We have a tendency to adapt to positive or negative situations over time. 
This means that even if we achieve what we were going after, the sense of excitement wanes over time as we get used to the new normal. Again, I believe the author's observation is correct. Much like with drugs or alcohol where repetitive use causes one to build up a tolerance where more of the substance is required in order to produce the same effect, we can become complacent with things and people that used to bring us consistent joy. This life will bring pain and suffering and obstacles of all kinds. And if our happiness is solely conditioned by these external factors, we will forever be a puppet on the strings of life. But this is why God instructs us to derive our joy directly from Him, so that nothing and no one on this earth can ever be accountable for producing our happiness. A misplaced hope will inevitably lead to less happiness. You see, the good news is that we don't hope as the world hopes. Christians don't have to work for joy as the world does. We work from joy. Peter wrote, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Nothing could bring more peace, more hope, or more joy than being eternally connected to the source of peace, hope, and joy. Now let's examine the solutions that the author puts forward for achieving or maintaining happiness. He lists the four pillars of happiness as self-care, living in the present, acceptance, and positive thinking. He writes, I've learned over the years that happiness cannot be found externally, it can only come from within. For us to become truly happy, there is a formula. We have to follow this formula and build strong daily habits to experience inner peace and happiness. Like anything worth doing, it's hard work, but if we can achieve a great sense of happiness and well-being, it's worth the effort. Although I see the author's point to a degree, it's not accurate to say that happiness cannot be found externally and it can only come from within. First, there's many external things that can make us happy, such as food, a friendly gathering, a good movie, etc. So justification deals with whether or not you have evidential reasons for arriving at a belief, even if you stumble upon a true belief accidentally. Therefore, one must be justified in determining what in fact is true. And that is a philosophical standard that we all need to adhere to. Now, an internalist might say that justification will be determined based upon the internal access of the individual to assess the truth of a statement or situation. An externalist, as you might imagine, would say that factors or evidences external to or outside of the individual are the primary method for determining what is a justified true belief. Now it's worth noting that one might distinguish between two importantly different notions of justification, standardly referred to as propositional justification and doxastic justification, sometimes ex ante justification or ex post justification respectively. Now, unlike that between internalist and externalist approaches to justification, the distinction between propositional and doxastic justification does not represent a conflict to be resolved. It is a distinction between two distinct properties that are called justification. Propositional justification concerns whether a subject has sufficient reason to believe a given proposition. Doxastic justification concerns whether a given belief is held appropriately. Now, one common way of relating the two is to suggest that propositional justification is the more fundamental and that doxastic justification is a matter of a subject's having a belief that is properly responsive to or based on their propositional justification. Quick side note, Christianity covers both. We have sufficient reasons to believe the propositions in Christianity and that belief is held appropriately given how we accessed knowledge about Christ. Additionally, we have the internal witness of the Holy Spirit and the external evidences of history, archaeology, 
science, and philosophy. Also, if happiness can only come from within, then what happens when there is a problem within? For example, if there's a mental illness or depressive event, you know, formulas may help, but deep down, the individual will always know that the formula made them feel better, whether they are actually healed or not. Now, there's been much discussion in recent years surrounding the idea of self-care. Self-care articles litter the shelves of bookstores and online and at the grocery store checkout. Self-care has been on the rise as we have witnessed the harmful effects of people on the edge due to mental burnout or undiagnosed mental disorders. Additionally, a global pandemic and social unrest weighed on many people in many different ways and we have been encouraged to take time to take care of ourselves so that we are mentally and physically healthy it is important to take care of ourselves the sabbath to a degree can be seen as god's plan for self-care diana kelter writes in 2019 two terms describing consumer behavior became dominant themes burnout and decision paralysis as a result, it's not a surprise the 2010s are being marked as the decade that self-care went mainstream. In most rhetoric, self-care is discussed through the lens of instant comfort. A face mask at the end of a long day, binge watching a show, or staying home instead of going out. These small rewards are valuable and will not soon disappear. But the focus on instant satisfaction has made self-care a placebo for managing burnout versus a remedy. The importance of self-care will likely not decline anytime soon. But how we engage in self-care does matter. The author writes, as we get older, we have to start taking care of our bodies and minds. Take time out for yourself, read, walk in nature, treat yourself. We should try to feed our bodies with a balanced, nutritious diet, exercise daily, and make time for meditation. Now this is all well and good, but is there something more to the core that if cared for will actually positively influence us in every other area of life? This is not an either or, but a both and situation. If you feel the need to take a break from work or get a pedicure, by all means do so. But when the break is over and when the pedicure is done, is that happiness truly rooted in you? Happiness is largely conditional, but God offers something greater, which is joy. See, joy is a gift from God to us. Joy is permanent and dwells in your soul as a gift of the Holy Spirit. Joy is based on your permanent position in God, not your feelings about life. The Apostle Peter writes, But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also be glad with exceeding joy. The question can rightly be posed. Why would we be glad with exceeding joy because we get to partake of Christ's sufferings? See, when we understand what this entails, it brings a permanent sense of hope and expectation. That permanence brings with it a permanence of joy. In fact, one of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul lists in Galatians 5 is joy. In the same way that love, peace, gentleness, and the other fruits of the Spirit flow from the Holy Spirit to and through us, joy does and should as well. It's a package deal. We don't get only part of the Holy Spirit, we get all of Him. And this is what enabled Nehemiah to say, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So, just like the external factors that may make us temporarily happy, a purely worldly self-care routine will not provide enduring happiness either. Next, we are advised to live in the present. Now, generally speaking, this is good advice. Don't dwell too long on the past and don't get so entranced with the future. The author writes, Eckhart Tolle, the master of living in the present said, if you are not living this moment, you're not really living. We spend so much of our time living in the past or worrying about the future that we forget sometimes to embrace and enjoy the present moment. We can only be truly happy in the here and now. But our understanding of the present will be largely based upon the past and contingent on future events, which means we can't only live in the present. What would be better is if we knew we didn't need to worry about past failures or future mistakes because they had already been accounted for. Psalm 118.24 reads, 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. But the reason that the psalmist can rejoice in the present is because of what was done for him in the past and because of the future he can confidently expect. Verse 21, describing what happened in the past allows for them to rejoice in the present. It reads, I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and have become my salvation. Likewise, the psalm ends with verse 29, which reads, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Forever encapsulates the future assurance that makes present day happiness a real possibility. This future guarantee allows us to have certainty about our identity, our moral slate, and our purpose. The third pillar of happiness, as the author says, is acceptance. The author writes, to truly be happy, we have to accept our physical impermanence in this world. Every single person on this earth is mortal. We are all on the same journey as one. Knowing that we are not going to be here forever and that nothing is permanent can have a transformative effect on how we live and helps us embrace and cherish every special moment on this beautiful planet. We cannot live without dying. We cannot die without living. Now, we could spend an entire video examining these statements and their implications for morality, hope, and meaning. I have other videos where I've delved into those concepts more deeply. However, let's begin with the last statement. We cannot live without dying. We cannot die without living. True, you cannot live without dying, but you absolutely can die without fully living. And fortunately, many people do just that. It's one of the reasons this channel is called Relentless Pursuit of Purpose. See, purpose makes life worth living and removes the sting of boredom and death. The author is correct that we are all on a journey called life and that is impermanent and we will eventually die. However, simply accepting that reality doesn't bring much happiness if we think it through. There's a number of issues that arise, but here's just a few. First, if this life is all there is and there is no judgment after this, then true or complete justice will never be achieved for a large majority of people. This means those who have done wrong or specifically done wrong to you will never be held accountable. This idea, even if one is able to accept it, will not bring happiness. Second, realizing that you will die one day may very well enable us to embrace and cherish every special moment on this beautiful planet. However, accepting this reality of life does nothing to inform us which moments to embrace and cherish. If we only embrace and cherish moments that please our flesh, we may be happy in the short term, but the long term effects of such a life will not be happiness. G.K. Chesterton said, meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. The existential search for meaning becomes meaningless if we can't ground the source of meaning in some objective fashion. And the fourth pillar of happiness as listed by the author is positive thinking. The author writes, positive thinking can have a transformative effect on our happiness and general well-being. We have to learn to shift our mindset to have a positive outlook. To make this shift, we have to practice gratitude daily. This helps us focus on the positive aspects of our lives. I find writing down five things that I am thankful for every day helps to build the habit. I really like the author's suggestion to write down five things that he is thankful for each day. This will keep God's goodness front and center in our lives. However, without an objective moral framework, that originates from a source that transcends us, we never truly know if what we are thinking is positive or negative. Sure, almost everyone would agree that thoughts of murder are negative, but even that requires an external objective moral standard, but for now we'll leave that alone. The problem becomes the inability to sustain behavior modification. One leadership writer, Sarah Drew Morgan notes, I contend that current behavior mod approaches are not only faulty, but seriously harmful to a large population of people who need to consider permanent change. You see, behavior modification does not instigate new behaviors or permanently change existing ones. In diet, smoking cessation, 
and exercise maintenance alone, there is a 97% failure rate for ongoing adoption of altered behaviors. But the solution that God and his word offers is to change your mind so that the thoughts that proceed from it now proceed primarily from him. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 reads, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Likewise, Paul wrote in Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And Jesus offers two perspectives and sources for peace in our minds. John records, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. You can take peace from Christ or peace obtained through worldly measures and standards. There are still many instances where, as a Christian, I think negative thoughts, but God's word provides the foundation, a positive, life-affirming foundation for how to think and to which I can return when I do go astray. Gratitude is a worthwhile attribute, but it is most effective when it is rooted in a loving, perfect, and unchanging source. It is to him that we should be most grateful, and it is him who is our source of joy and hope. But I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments. What do you think about these strategies for achieving happiness in life? And how do you find joy in and through God? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And until next time, peace.